Ah, we are live. Uh, welcome to uh, the online Gurdjieff group meeting. Uh, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, um, I was just telling uh, um, Angelica and Karen that I have a tablet right down in front of me. And I should be able to see comments that people make with just having to look down. Uh, so those of you who are watching live on Facebook at some point, if you have any questions or whatever, um, just uh, type them in and hopefully I may be able to see them and respond to them. Looks like a, a few people are joining us already on Facebook. So today, and they're just doing the vacuuming upstairs. I thought they did it about 10 minutes ago. So you may hear a little bit of noise from up there. Um, hopefully they'll be done soon. Uh, today, I am going to really focus on the theory of impressions. And what I'm building up to, uh, I'm sure this is going to be a series of talks, is to understanding and comprehending the nature of the misuse of C12. But in order to understand the misuse of C12, it's necessary to understand impressions, and it's necessary to understand crystallizations. Um, do you hear the, are, am I, are you hearing me okay? Um, or do you hear the vacuum upstairs? Okay. You're hearing me okay? Are you hearing the vacuum? I'm hearing you okay, but you, you go in and out a bit. Yeah, it must be the vacuum upstairs. Um, Ian, how are you this morning? Okay, Ian joined us, but I don't know if he can hear us. Uh, at any rate, yes. uh, oh, there he is. Um, while they're vacuuming upstairs, normally they do this a little early on Sunday morning, uh, I'm going to speak loudly. And let's do what we did last week. Let's become aware of our eyes. Become aware of our eyes perceiving visual information. Become aware of the foveal point, which if you hold your arm out, it's about the tip of your thumb. That's actually the focal point where we focus and it becomes more and more peripheral as we extend our vision. So, do your best to become aware of your eyes and become aware of your eyes receiving visual impressions. And then become aware of your ears and become aware of your ears receiving visual impressions. Actually, I'm going to step back for a moment. Um, I was hoping that would be done with the uh, um, vacuuming by now. Um, but what I'm going to do is, you know, we're doing this work not for ourselves. We, part of it's for ourselves, part of it's for humanity, and part of it is for the earth. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff's vow, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be, I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. So every time we do any kind of inner work, we are performing a service to humanity and to the earth herself. So this is not just something we do for ourselves. And anytime we become mindful, anytime we bring our attention here and now to this present moment, in whatever capacity, uh, whatever level we can, we are doing inner work. We can be outside, walking down the street, aware of the breeze touching our face, the sun caressing our skin, uh, the sound of the traffic or trees or birds. When we bring our attention into this mindful awareness, we are doing inner work. We are building a solid foundation also for the growth of our inner being. And 
The misuse of C12, the misuse of sexual energy prevents this proper, harmonious, balanced growth of our inner being, and it leads to a deformed essence. So let's become aware of our eyes. Let's become aware of our eyes receiving visual impressions coming in in the form of light. Now, you may notice different colors, different hues, shades. Try to become aware of the peripheral of your vision, up, sideways, down, across, while keeping your eyes focused straight ahead. Try to notice things in your visual perception, your visual field that you would not normally notice. And then try to become aware of what you can hear. Perhaps the sound of my voice, perhaps noises around you, uh, traffic noises or natural noises or birds or whatever. Try to become aware of your ears, perceiving sound. Then try to become aware of the smell that is entering your nose. Try to become aware of any scents that are around you, perhaps your own bodily odor, perhaps the scent of the room that you're in. Try to, to notice, you know, scents right there up front and peripheral scents, the edges of our scents. And then try to become aware of your taste buds. And we all have a taste in our mouth. So try to become aware of the taste in your mouth. Now let's Try to overlap these. Try to become aware of your eyes perceiving visual information, your ears perceiving auditory information sounds, your nose perceiving olfactory information, smells, odors, and your taste buds receiving gustatory information, the taste in your mouth. Try to do this all at the same time. Try to, with intent, mindfully, Look, listen, smell, and taste. Try to become aware of these four external perceptions. Try to become aware of what you can see here and now in this moment, what you are hearing, what you are smelling, and what you are tasting. Sort of like layers of perceptions. And then just allow your attention to rest. And let's relax the body, starting with the top of the head, just relaxing the top of the head, the crown of your head, and then moving down to your forehead, your eyebrows, moving down to your eyes, face, nose, the sides of your head, moving down to your mouth and jaw, your chin, down to your throat and neck, relaxing your shoulders, Relaxing your upper arms, your chest, your upper back. Relaxing your midriff, your solar plexus, your elbows, your middle back. Relaxing your lower arms, your lower back, your lower abdomen. And moving down, relaxing your pelvis, your hips, your buttocks. And down to your upper legs, relaxing them, relaxing your knees, relaxing your lower legs, your ankles, relaxing your feet. Mr. Gurdjieff said it's important to learn to relax the body when we begin to prepare for inner work. And we should be able to get to the point where we can just quickly relax our body. And so I would like you to breathe in to the top of your head. And then as you breathe out, send a gentle wave of relaxation down your body, down to the bottom of your feet, and then breathing in to the top of your head and relaxing your body as you breathe out. And then doing this a third time, breathing in to the top of your head and relaxing your body as you breathe out. And ideally, we would like to be able to just do that, to breathe in and then just relax the body, put the body into a nice state of comfortable relaxation. And for some of you who are new to the work, you may have to practice this, but the more you do it, the more familiar you get 
with just relaxing the body, the easier it becomes. And then the important next step is to develop the sensory awareness of our body. And we're gonna be doing Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. So as a vessel fills with warm golden honey, just fill your body slowly with sensations starting in the bottom of the feet and then sensing your whole feet, sensing up to your ankles, up through your lower legs to your knees, up through your knees to your upper legs to your hips and hands, and then filling with sensation from the bottom of your feet all the way up to your midriff, your elbows, your middle back, and then moving up your upper arms, your chest, your upper back, up to your shoulders. Then filling with sensation all the way up through your neck and up through your head. Sensing your body as one organic whole. Sensing your physical body or what Mr. Gurdjieff referred to as the sensation of self. This is, as I've talked about many times, the most important preliminary inner exercise is to develop this sensory awareness of our body. And I will hopefully either today or next week explain a little greater detail why this is so. So holding this awareness of your body in the background, however you can. Also, while remaining aware of your body, become aware of what you see, the interplay of light and shadow, color and hue, shape and form, things in the center of your vision, things in the peripheral of your vision, and while holding on to these visual impressions coming in through your eyes, also become aware of what you can hear, the sound of my voice, perhaps any sounds around you. And while becoming and holding on to what you see here, also become aware of what you smell and taste while sensing your body as one organic whole, while developing the sensation of self. And this is something that we have to build up to if we are just new to the work. It is necessary, perhaps, just to start trying to sense our legs, for instance, or just trying to become aware of what we see, or to try to develop that awareness of our body and only become aware of what we can see. And gently, as we master each one of these tasks, becoming more and more and more complex. This is the consciously or not consciously, mindfully looking, listening, smelling, and tasting while sensing our body as one organic whole is really intermediate self-remembering. Advanced self-remembering, full self-remembering is also bringing the feeling brain, the emotional brain online. And Mr. Gurdjieff said that sometimes we can do this and just with our breath, breathe in just a tiny bit of joy. So if you can consciously or mindfully, I shouldn't use the word conscious because that reflects a higher level than the mindful level. If you can mindfully become aware of what you see, hear, smell, taste while sensing your body and then just breathe in a tiny dollop of joy, you will be touching the three brain state. And this is when you are starting to become a fairly serious grounded man number four. Man number four is the realm of uh, world 24, the mindfulness realm. And I'm not going to explain it today. Go back and look at some of the past meetings. I've gone into quite great detail about that. But the full three-brained, so our head perceptions of external impressions coming in, the sensations of our body, and becoming aware of feeling and doing this all at the same time is the goal that we should be striving to achieve. So consciously, as best you can, or intentionally and deliberately as best you can, Become aware of your eyes receiving visual impressions. And then become aware of your ears receiving auditory impressions. 
And then become aware of your nose receiving olfactory impressions, scents, odors. And then become aware of your taste buds receiving uh, gustatory impressions, the taste. And sensing your body as one organic whole and putting it all together and perhaps trying to breathe in a little bit of feeling, a little bit of joy. Maybe smile, maybe form a smile with your lips, a smile with your eyes, and bring a tiny bit of joy into the process, harmonizing your three brains, bringing them together. And then allow your attention to rest. And Mr. Gurdjieff said it's good to end inner work with the collected state exercise. So as the earth has an atmosphere, so too do we have an atmosphere. And our atmosphere can be dispersed, it can be pulled away. We think of something far away, our atmosphere gets dispersed in that level. We're upset, we're emotionally identified. How could they say that to me? I can't believe that happened. Our atmosphere gets dispersed or through sensations through our body, oh, my knee, my hip. Um, so try to keep your atmosphere calm, tranquil. Keep your thoughts tranquil. Keep your body, your sensations tranquil. Keep your feelings tranquil. Try to collect your atmosphere so it's about a meter, meter and a half, about four to six feet around you. Become aware of the border of your atmosphere, where your atmosphere ends. Collect it, keep it tranquil, keep it calm. And in a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I get to three, breathe it in. And then as you breathe out, imagine that something of it remains inside you to settle inside you. And this imagination is a head brain uh, process. So we're actually harmonizing two brains that way. So become aware of your atmosphere, collect it, keep it calm, keep it tranquil, keep it still around you. And one, two, three, breathe your atmosphere in. And then as you breathe out, imagine something remains. And then it's always good to finish inner work, particularly if you do some kind of deliberate sitting with an affirmation. And this is Mr. Gurdjieff's affirmation. May the results of this exercise, just repeat that silently in your mind, may the results of this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just be present here in this moment. And uh, to talk about the misuse of C12, this is an immense topic. I'm going to begin with the theory of impressions. So, um, oops, this is not, wait, wait. I've got to lower this slightly. So, hey, Alan, yes? Your, uh, your audio and your signal seems to be kind of cutting in and out. I thought it was just me, but Karen just said something. Okay. I'm connected to the ethernet. Um, Am I okay now? Uh, I mean, we'll see how it goes. But, but I'm okay now. It's not just now. It comes and goes. You go, you disappear. Okay. Well, not um, the video, but the audio, and then the video freezes up. Oh, we, we've got another person who managed to uh, come into our meeting, Laura. Okay. Um, am I freezing up? Am I freezing up? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see. Um, uh, let me try and connect a different way. Okay, how am I now? Well, you're okay for the minute, but we well, I, I, I've, I've actually gone into a different internet inter whoops, a different internet connection. Um, but I may have disconnected from online. I'm not sure. 
Okay, I've gone on to a different internet connection. I was trying to connect through the Ethernet. Um, can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, well, I'll have to review that um, later and uh, uh, see, I may have to cut some of it out before I put it on YouTube. Um, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, uh, um, internet, computers, different connections. I thought I was being wise. I had it connected to the Ethernet, but I've gone onto a different connection right now. Hopefully, this one is more stable. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about um, impressions. In order to understand the misuse of C12 and what can go wrong, it is important to first understand impressions. So, uh, Writing in Beelzebub Tales to his grandson, George Gurdjieff cryptically refers to some events that were supposed to have happened at the moment he was born. And in particular, this is a quote, there poured the vibrations of sound which arose in a neighbor's house from an Edison photograph, phonograph. Um, as we will see, this is impossible. He's making this up. Um, but there are three possible years he was born, 1866, 1872, and 1877. And he was very cryptic about this. They found personal documents, um, passports, other things, uh, with all of these dates on them, um, particularly the first two, 1866 and 1872. Now, in Beelzebub Tales, he talks about how the sounds of the Edison phonograph came in through the window when he was born. And 1877 is considered to be the least likely with most favoring 1866, particularly because this lines up with various times he told people his age and simply I made a spelling mistake there, simply counting backwards leads us to the earliest date. So the question, so the question is why refer to the phonograph which wasn't manufactured until later? Here's a picture of Thomas Edison with his second phonograph in Washington as he was demonstrating it to the public in April of 1878. So it's virtually impossible that some lady in the Caucasus could have been in possession of an Edison phonograph in 1877 so that the sounds would have been coming through his window. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff also in meetings with the remarkable men uh, in the last chapter on the material question talks about how as a young adult, he made a lot of money taking a phonograph from fairs to fairs and you know market to market, and people would put on little headphones and he would play it and he would charge money for it. So with Mr. Gurdjieff, you've got to put pieces together. You've got to start thinking, what does he mean? Why did he put that in tales? Why did he emphasize it when it's, most likely he was not born on that date. It would have made him a much younger man when he died. By all accounts, you know, he was in his 80s. Things line up with the 1866 date. Now, these are wax cylinders that were used to imprint, impress on them the sound that uh, was made. Um, this is actually uh, 1922 dictaphone. So someone would speak into that, and I believe they could record approximately 1,200 words on this wax cylinder. Uh, so the sound got impressed onto the substance, onto the wax, and created. This is one of Edison's um, later phonographs, the wheel to turn it to make the sound. And he doesn't use the word 
impressions in Beelzebub Tales to his grandson, that novel where he really embedded the teachings. He uses the word crystallizations. So if you understand that when he is talking about crystallizations, he's talking about things crystallizing within us. So do, this is all important. He talked about impressions. There's some kind of substance within ourselves and things get impressed on the substance. Things that we see, things that we hear, things that we smell, things that we taste, things that we sense, things that we feel, but it gets far more complex than this. So again, you know, when I'm going to uh, uh, bring up some quotes and I'm going to read them, as I scroll down, try to use that as an opportunity to at least bring yourself back to your breathing, to bring yourself back to your body, to allow yourself to become aware of what you see, what you hear, possibly what you're tasting, um, other things that may be going on. And so I'm going to call this up. Um, uh, so this comes from In Search of the Miraculous. Man is a machine. All his deeds, actions, words, thoughts, feelings, convictions, opinions, and habits are the result of external influences. And I've highlighted external impressions. If he uses the word external impressions, then there must also be internal impressions. So out of himself, a man cannot produce a single thought, a single action. Everything he says, does, thinks, feels, all this happens. Man cannot discover anything, invent anything at all. It all happens. To establish this fact for oneself, to understand it, to be convinced of its truth, means getting rid of a thousand illusions in, about man, about his being creative and consciously organizing his own life. So here, you know, we have external impressions, we have internal impressions, and a lot of our impressions are re-impressions, such as thoughts, such as feelings, such as images we remember, such as words we hear. So the whole understanding of impressions is a, a massive topic. But something is impressed on some kind of substance within us. Something is crystallized within us. So when I get to C12, the misuse of C12 allows abnormal crystallizations to develop within us. And these abnormal crystallizations he also talks about a deformed essence so at the level of world 24 at the level of our essence in the growth of our inner being the growth of our inner body the misuse of c12 leads to various abnormal growths within us and again this is from in search of the miraculous in order to understand what the difference between states of consciousness is, let us return first, uh, let us return to the first state of consciousness, which is sleep. This is an entirely subjective state of consciousness. A man is immersed in dreams, whether he remembers them or not, does not matter. Even if some real impressions reach him, such as sounds, voices, warmth, cold, the sensation of his own body. They arouse in him only fantastic subjective images. Then a man wakes up. At first glance, this is quite a different state of consciousness. He can move, he can talk with other people, 
He can make calculations ahead. He can see danger and avoid it and so on. It stands to reason that he is in a better position than he was than when he was asleep. But if we go a little more deeply into things, if we take a look into his inner world, into his thoughts, into the causes of his actions, we shall see that he is in almost the same state as when he was asleep. So think about it. You're dreaming. A sound comes in. That sound causes a change in the direction of your dream. They arouse these subjective things with inside. Maybe a voice calls up your mother's voice, or a loud noise causes, brings up the sound of gunfire, or whatever. Pulling up something that's already within us, something that has already been impressed within us, some previous impression. So here we, gotta, we have to understand that there are different impressions. And I'm just going to slip over to this. Um, oops. Uh, we've got impressions. So we've got external impressions, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory. So seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, particularly when we are aware of what is going on right here and now in this moment. But we also have internal impressions. For instance, words are internal impressions. You are not hearing my words. My mouth, my tongue, the, the lips, the movement of my tongue, the shape of my mouth are forming certain phonemes, which are little microscopic, so to speak, bits of sound or atoms of sound. And these atoms of sound, these phonemes are actually drawing up the corresponding impressions in your mind. So you think you are hearing me, but you are not hearing me. Just like when we look at the words on the screen here, that top word, impressions, you are not really seeing the word impressions on the screen. Your mind is overlaying the meaning with the squiggles that are on the screen. You've learned through habit, through association, to impress or superimpose a meaning on those letters. If it was in Cyrillic, the, the Russian language, uh, even though it could be phonetic, you wouldn't understand it. Sanskrit is a phonetic under, a language. If I wrote impressions in Sanskrit phonetically, you would not understand it because you have not developed those automatic associations. So all words we hear, all words we see are actually pulling up impressions that were previously impressed on the substance within us. And not just words. I mean, we think in thoughts. And those thoughts are previous impressions, and they're also leading to new impressions. So when you learn a language, you hear a word once, and it's like pouring it from the empty to the void. And you hear it twice, 10 times, 100 times. Something begins to build up and grow inside you that allows you to understand that language. And this is also why elderly people who, you know, I know people who left their home countries around the age of 20, and they're now in their 80s, and they haven't really spoken their native language, and they begin or have begun to forget a lot of it because those impressions need to be re-impressed. They need to be refreshed or they begin to kind of dissolve and fade away. And so if we're not in contact with our native language, if we're not continually having those impressions pulled up, reinforced externally and internally through our own inner dialogue, those impressions begin to fade away. 
And here we can also use the word crystallizations because these things grow inside us. You hear a word once in a foreign language and it's like pouring from the empty to the void. Ten times, a hundred times, something begins to take shape in you, something that has a more solid, more durable form. But you've got to stay current in that language. You've got to keep on bringing those impressions up, reinforcing them, recrystallizing them. So our internal impressions, the words that we hear, and every time we think, we're also reinforcing those linguistic impressions within us. The images that we have in our mind, um, you may have an image of your mother when you call that up, that started out as a physical external impression. And then whenever you think of your mother, you're bringing that impression up and you're re-impressing it within yourself. You're, cre you're, you're creating a bigger crystallization, so to speak, within ourself. Um, so Mr. Gurdjieff talked about mentation by thought. That is mentation by words and mentation by form which is seeing, hearing, smelling, and tasting. As I mentioned in the last meeting, we can conjure up the image of our mother. We can uh, recall perhaps what it was like to hold our mother's hand. We can perhaps recall our mother's perfume, the sound of her voice. We are reanimating, re, uh, I guess the best word is reanimating those impressions, those crystallizations we have. And this is why, if you haven't thought of someone in a long time, you might begin to forget the sound of their voice or what they look like or other things because it hasn't been reinforced. And if you think of a memory over and over and over and over again, uh, you hold on to that memory. If something happens to you and you don't ever think about it again, it disappears because we have to continually keep on reinforcing these impressions. And every time we do, we crystallize something within us. All of our, you know, we call them memories, but there's something happening within us. You know, either a crystallization or an impression, something being impressed on our inner being. And there are impressions and then there are re-impressions we can speak about coming from within our inner being. And uh, now I will come go back to this. So you're sleeping and you, uh, someone's talking in another room and then that touches some impressions inside you and that leads the way the dream goes. And it's all these subjective images, these subjective things inside of ourselves. And this becomes important, this understanding becomes important to know where we've gone wrong, what has happened to us. Um, so, and this is quite scary when you think about it. Even though we are awake, we're walking around, we're doing things, there is very little to distinguish ourselves between the dream state and the state Mr. Gurdjieff called waking consciousness, I prefer to talk about it as waking sleep, where we are slumbering through life and we live in a very subjective world. And if you understand this, you can begin to understand other people. They are not living in the same reality as you are living. Each person is slave to all of the impressions that have been previously impressed upon them and the re-impressions of thoughts and of images that they thought about. And this is something real within ourselves. There's an actual substance within ourselves. There's an actual crystallization of form within ourselves. And this accounts for a lot of the problems in the world today, a lot of problems with humanity. When Mr. Gurdjieff talks about people being in a subjective state, it means they are not perceiving reality as it really should be perceived. 
Um, I talked about this one before. It must be understood that man consists of two parts, essence and personality. Essence in man is what is his own. Personality in man is what is not his own. Not his own means what comes from outside, what he has learned or reflects. All traces of exterior impressions left in the memory and in the sensations. All words and movements that have been learned. All feelings created by imitation. All this is not his own. All this is personality. So here, exterior impressions. So words, I don't understand uh, the lady who lives upstairs from me. She's Chinese. When she speaks Chinese, I do not have those impressions of Chinese within me. It just, I, I can't hear it because I have not learned and I haven't had that impressed in me over a sufficient length of time. So, in a sense, I like to also refer to these as artificial impressions. Words. Uh, you see, we, 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 we slogans and the images that go along with slogans. You know, political slogans, political images, the hammer and sickle. You know, the, 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 the Jewish conspiracy with the big nose. And these all summon up a massive array of impressions that we already have inside us. Um, we've recently seen this with what is going on in America and, you know, the racist uh, tweets and uh, things of Donald Trump. He's pulling up these massive impressions that people have kept and subdued and only shared um, with their closest friends, and now they're coming to the surface. Those are, you know, things of the slogans, the coded words, all of that are just pulling up these abnormal subjective growths that people have within themselves, these exterior impressions. Um, so, Again, further in In Search of the Miraculous, the human organism receives three kinds of food. The ordinary food we eat, the air we breathe, our impressions. It is not difficult to agree that air is a kind of food for the organism, but in what way impressions can be food may appear at first difficult to understand. We must, however, remember that with every external impression, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, even we can include the sensation of our body on this as well, the touch of air on our skin, uh, the touch of clothing on our skin, the things that come from outside. So any external impression, whether it takes the form of sound or vision or smell, we receive from outside a certain amount of energy, a certain number of vibrations. This energy which enters the organism from outside is food. Moreover, as has been said before, energy cannot be transmitted without matter. If an external impression brings external energy with it into the organism, it means that external matter also enters, which feeds the organism in the full meaning of the term. Our lights, our lights, our eyes are receiving photons. They are receiving visual impressions. We now have devices that can measure the frequency of light, the color, the intensity. Light hits the 10 million photoreceptors in our eyes, and it is transformed. And the word transformation is important. It is transformed into electrical signals in our brain. Our eyes, it sends the signal to the occipital lobe in the back of our skull. Uh, that, then it goes to the, that's the primary visual processing area. Then it goes to the secondary 
visual processing area where it's flipped back over and other impressions, other things are added to it. Then it's beamed to the prefrontal cortex. There's an immense process that goes on. Uh, from receiving the impressions, when you look at the screen and you see the words, you are not seeing the raw data that is coming into your eyes, the raw food that is coming into your eyes. You're seeing a fairly advanced part of the transformational process. And your eyes, you know, for like the moreover or the yellow external impressions, that is coming purely from your mind. Um, I've talked about this before. Imagine, you know, walking into a room. In this room where I am now, I've got chairs and a sofa and a table and lights. I walk into any room with a chair, sofa, table and lights, and I see chairs, sofa, tables and lights. But imagine a raccoon coming into this room. What would it see? It would not see a chair, a table, a light, it would see something different. I am projecting the meaning on an object that looks like a chair. I'm projecting the meaning on an object that looks like a sofa, a table, a light. Uh, I was once walking uh, through uh, a woods behind a house where I lived in Quebec in the middle of a forest uh, many years ago, and there was a rock shaped like a throne. It had two armrests, it had a place you could sit, and I sat down on this chair in the forest that was at least 12,000 years old. Um, it was probably formed through the melting of the glaciers that were once over the region. But I saw a chair, and that was me overlaying that uh, understanding, visually imposing my meaning onto the chair. So. We've got to become aware of just how we impose meaning on the world. And this meaning is subjective. I call it a chair. Um, Angelica in Brazil would use another word. Someone in France would use another word. Someone in China would use another word. These words all mean chair, but they're also different impressions, linguistic impressions. So what we see is very subjective. We overlay meaning on everything, especially when we hear people in our native language. You go to a cafe, you're sitting behind someone, it's impossible for you not to understand what they are saying because their words are calling up all sorts of impressions that have been previously impressed within you all sorts of crystallizations. And the sound waves come into our ears. We don't hear the sound waves. It's transformed again into the electrical impulses. It's this transformation. This is how the external impressions feed us. And I've mentioned how J.G. Bennett said that you know what we receive visually, auditorily, olfactory, uh, gustatory, in terms of our eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds, we don't even have to be aware of it. We can be in a completely mechanical state, thinking about a TV show last night, and I don't like what that character said, in a complete state of hallucination, but our eyes are still receiving information. Our ears are still receiving food. Our taste buds, our nose, they're still receiving that energy. And this is also where mindfulness becomes really important. In the chapter on hypnosis in Beelzebub Tales, Mr. Gurdjieff said that ultimately we want our conscious and our subconscious mind to work together. A moment ago, your subconscious mind was fully aware of the sensation of the bottom of your feet. Now that you are mindful of the bottom of your feet, your conscious and your subconscious mind are operating in harmony. But your subconscious mind a moment ago was aware of your knees. It was still feeding off that awareness. A moment ago, perhaps your subconscious mind was aware of visual information in your peripheral. And now that you are aware of it, you're bringing both of these into alignment, into harmony. 
J.G. Bennett says that the human organism can directly feed off Go48 of the Octobub impressions. It does not need to be transformed to Ray24. It does not need to have that movement upwards. We don't have to pay attention to what we see, hear, smell, taste, and it is still feeding us. It is still transforming us. We are still receiving impressions. We are still receiving energy. And this is physical. There is a physical feeding that goes on. And what happens is these crystallize within us. They get impressed within us. Um, so moving on to In Search of the Miraculous again, alchemists who spoke of this transmutation began directly with it. They knew nothing, or at least they said nothing, about the nature of the first volitional shock, or the first conscious shock. It is upon this, however, that the whole thing depends. The second volitional shock and the transmutation become physically possible only after long practice on the first volitional shock, which consists in self-remembering and in observing the impressions received. In other words, becoming aware of the light coming into the eyes, being mindful of what's in our focal point and what's in the peripheral of our vision, becoming mindful of what we're hearing, the sounds coming in, becoming mindful of the smells entering, becoming mindful of the taste in our mouth. While sensing the body, that's also very important, so we've got to practice becoming conscious or mindful of what we see, hear, smell, and taste as often as we can. And this is where the first conscious shock really comes in. Nature has provided everything up until this point, and this is not necessary for nature's purpose. Humanity will not awaken en masse. It's impossible. It would leave a huge gap in the transformation of energies on this planet and life itself would collapse. We need sleeping, slumbering people, but we also need a small percentage of people to awaken. So on the way of the monk, on the way of the fakir, work on the second shock begins before work on the first shock. That's work on C12 and the use of C12. But as Me-12 is created only as a result of the first shock, and Me-12 is of the octave of impressions, C-12 is of the octave of food. They're both on the same level. They're different molecules. Um, but as Me-12 is created only as a result of the first shock, work in the absence of other material has of necessity to be concentrated on C-12. And it very often gives quite wrong results. Right development of the fourth way must begin with the first volitional shock and then pass on to the second shock at me 12. And this is something I will explain uh, next week about the way of uh, the monk. And I'm, I'm not using monk in the uh, way Mr. Gurdjieff is using. I'm using monk as people who flee from the world, uh, take vows of celibacy, uh, they change their name, they wear robes, they cut their hair. They do everything to prevent the misuse of C12. And understanding the monastic life and what it entails shows us how, just through the inverse image, how mis uh, C12 is misused because the whole monastic life is designed to prevent the misuse of C12. And as I said, I will talk a lot more about that next week. Um, so the third work in the human organism begins when man creates in him a conscious volitional shock at the point of me 12 when the transformation or transmutation of these hydrogens into higher hydrogens begins within him. The second stage and the beginning of the third stage refer to the life and functions of man number four. A fairly considerable period of transmutation and crystallization, the word crystallization in search of the miraculous, is needed 
for the transition of man number four to the level of man number five. So it's collecting impressions, crystallizing them in the proper form and sequence. This is all very, very important. Um, now, I am going to break a rule of mine. Just give me a second. I normally do not like to refer to Beelzebub Tales because you will never have a second chance to receive a first impression. And this book is really all about how to receive impressions properly. But I have mentioned that self-remembering must be done in the proper form and sequence, consciously or mindfully or intent intentionally looking, listening, smelling, tasting, while sensing the body. And so we have to learn how to sense the body. We have to develop the sensation of self first so that we can hold it in the back of our awareness and so that we can begin to crystallize our inner being, our Kesjian body in the proper form and sequence. And understanding this process also allows us to understand the misuse of C12. So this is Mr. Gurdjieff as our dear grandfather Beelzebub. Uh, for those who are new to this, Beelzebub was one of the sort of prime beings at the center of the universe. And he thought that there was something wrong in God's government and that he could kind of do a better job and fix it. And he got a whole bunch of his kinsmen and other beings at that level to agree with him. And in a sense, he created a bit of a civil war in those higher regions. And he was sent down to our solar system, banished here. And he talked about his youthful indiscretions, his youthful passion, when he didn't fully understand how things work. And the whole book, Beelzebub Tales, is about how he redeems himself through understanding humans and work that he does with the uh, Ashiata Shaimesh in terms of helping humanity. And then he is taken back up there, a much wiser uh, uh, figure, understanding the follies of his youth. Um, so, you know, it's not any kind of devil worship or whatever. It's using and recasting that myth of the fallen angel um, as a rebellion against God's government, but done for the best possible reason. He thought he saw something wrong. He messed up. He started to mess things up and he was banished along with his kinsmen and other people to our solar system where the book takes place. Um, so he's speaking to his grandson, Hussein. And Hussein, just before this period entails, was crying. And the deep empathy that was expressed in that passage led Beelzebub to tell and talk about this to Hussein. Um, so empathy, the ability to walk in another person's shoes, is a very important attribute and something we need to develop. So. I'm going to read this now, and it's done in a very convoluted language. Um, you've got to put up with it. Um, and as for that reason, which for most of your contemporary favorites has become habitual. Notice the word habit, habitual. So it's an automatic uh, reason. It's not a reasoned reason. It's habitual. And which I call the reason of knowing. Every kind of new impression perceived through this reason, and likewise, every kind of intentionally or simply automatically obtained result from the formerly perceived impressions is only a temporary part of the being and might result in them exclusively only in certain surrounding circumstances and on the definite condition that the information which constitutes all of his foundation and entirety should without fail from time to time, so to say, uh, be from time to time, so to say, refreshed or repeated. Otherwise, these formerly 
perceived impressions change of themselves or even entirely, so to say, evaporate out of the common presence of the three brain beings, that is the humans. This is the person who moves to Canada from Italy when they're 20 years old and they don't live in the Italian community. Um, perhaps like uh, my children, my ex-wife's grandparents, moving to a town in Northern Ontario where everyone spoke English. And then 60 years later, their Italian had diminished because it wasn't freshened from regular speech in the community. Or why we begin to forget what a person looked like or the sound of their voice as time goes on. These things fade away. They're, they need to be continually refreshed, brought up, and re-impressed, or else they begin to disappear. And he describes this as the reason of knowing. This is actually the improper receiving of impressions. This is the misuse of C12. Uh, done this way. Although in respect of the sacred triamazicamno, the sacred law of three, the affirming, the denying, the reconciling, uh, the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And here he's playing a trick with us. He's making us think extra hard. Although in respect of the sacred tree as in because, tree am as in because, I'm not even, I'll give up on that word. The process of the arising of both kinds of being reason flows equally. Yet the fulfilling factors for the actualization of its three separate holy forces are different. So the sacred tree am as no, and the three separate holy forces, namely for the formation of reason of knowing. This is a normal person's awareness. They walk into a room, see chairs and hear English and all of these things. The formerly perceived contradictory impressions crystallized in any one of their three localizations, which three brain beings have had body feelings, our head brain, our body brain, our feeling brain, our intellectual center, our physical center, our emotional center. Uh, the formerly perceived contradictory impressions crystallized in any one of the three localizations which three-brained beings have serve as the affirming and denying factors and the new impressions proceeding from without serve in this case as the third factor. This is here. This is the difference between self-remembering and a normal human state of awareness. And this is also in this, in this yellow part, this is also talking about the misuse of C12 and the abnormal crystallizations that can occur within us. Um, and for the reason of understanding, these factors are as follows. The first, that is the sacred affirming, is the newly perceived impression of any localization which has at the given moment what is called the center of gravity functioning. The second or sacred denying is the corresponding data present in another of his localizations. And the third factor is what is called being autocolonizers, or as they are otherwise called, uh, I'm not even going to pronounce that. The sense of which the name signifies the results of the preserving, actualizing of the striving towards the manifestation of one's individuality. 
here he gives us the key. If you understand, um, much earlier in tales, one of the prayers that uh, Mr. Gurdjieff uh, said we should engage in is holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Transubstantiate for me, in me, for my being. And uh, I have some uh, recordings on the uh, YouTube channel that this will be posted to in our exercises. And uh, these came from uh, uh, one of the members of my Tuesday evening group who spent uh, a dozen years with Paul Beidler, Beidler, who was a student of Mr. Gurdjieff. And for instance, we've done it, the three bones in our thumb. There's the top bone, the middle bone, and the bone in the palm. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Or moving through the, the, thing, the, the thumb, holy affirming, the index finger, holy denying, the middle finger, holy reconciling, the fourth finger, transubstantiate in me, and the fifth finger, for my being. Um, this has also been done in terms of the body. So our right lower leg, say the word holy, our right upper leg affirming, our pelvic bone, holy, our left upper leg bone denying, our left lower leg bone, holy, up our spine, including our skull, reconciling, and then our upper uh, bone in our upper right arm, transubstantiate, our lower arm in me, our upper arm for, and then my being. A uh, very important phrase, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Coming back here, you know, the sacred affirming, the sacred denying, the skeleton key for understanding this. And if we think of ourselves as a triangle, our head brain is the positive, our body brain is the negative, our feeling brain is the reconciling. Our head brain coming over here. Um, External impressions, visual, auditory, olfactory, and gustatory. So the proper way to receive impressions, the proper way to grow our being, to crystallize our inner being properly. In other words, to properly use the energies coming within us and not to misuse C12 is by mindfully looking, listening, smelling, and hearing, or looking, listening, smelling, and tasting. This is receiving impressions in the first position. First position is the top of the triangle. Now he also talks about the second or the sacred denying is the corresponding data present in another of his localizations. And again, what is this holy denying? What is the sacred denying? If the holy affirming in us represents our head brain and the holy denying represents our body brain, what he is actually talking about here and something that I've talked about many times is the need to develop the sensation of self, the need to develop the awareness of our organic body, our, our, our body as one organic whole. When we have this awareness, the sensation of our self built up to a sufficient quality, we've crystallized it within ourselves by doing it over and over and over and over. At first, it's like pouring from the empty to the void. But if we do it over and over and over and over and over again, we actually begin to crystallize and grow something substantial within ourselves. So this is the proper way we are supposed to grow our being, the proper form and sequence to receive external impressions. In other words, what the eyes 
receive, what the ears receive, what the nose, uh, the olfactory receptors in the nose receive, what the mouth, what the taste buds in the mouth receives to mindfully perceive our environment without bringing meaning onto it, without overlaying other things. And in order to do this, second position, so to speak, has to already be occupied. If we have not built up the sufficient sensing of our body, the awareness of our body as one organic whole, we will not properly receive impressions. So when he talks about to Uspensky, you know, what is the most important thing? And you guys haven't noticed it. It's that you are not present in your observations. And when Uspensky talks about self-remembering, he misuses the word feelings. Did you feel that? Yeah, I felt that. It's one of the limitations of English. The word sensing should be there. The sensation of our body, the awareness of our body should be part of all of our observations. And in the proper state of self-remembering, it's like we hold this awareness of our body in the second position. And when we hold our awareness of our body in the background, it allows us to receive impressions from the outside world, what we see, hear, smell, and taste. The outside impressions in the proper form and sequence. Um, we, it's all about the receiving of impressions. Now, uh, going back, um, just going back here slightly, uh, for the reason of knowing, in other words, the misuse of C12, the way most people learn things, the formerly perceived contradictory impressions crystallized in any one of the three localizations which three brain beings have, the head brain, the body brain, or the feeling brain, serve as the affirming and denying factors. And the new impressions proceeding from without serve, in this case, as the third factor. Sometimes you will notice this with elderly people. Mr. Gurdjieff says that unfortunately for a lot of elderly people, as they grow older, they are unable to receive a new impression. You say something and it pulls up a memory and they go, oh, that reminds me of 1950. Um, everything pulls up something within them because they have not allowed these things to be crystallized in the proper form and sequence. They are unable to receive a new impression. And as I mentioned earlier, reading Bales of Tales, especially for the first time, is all about receiving new impressions. We don't often get the chance to receive new linguistic impressions, and so he gives us 450 neologisms. And he introduces them, at, you know, at one point, doesn't explain them, 300 pages later, he gives a little bit more of an information, you know, clarification. Another 300 pages later, he gives a more clear definition of them. This is the way we receive linguistic impressions. Beelzebub Tales is really all about the proper receiving of impressions. And so when you, re when you read it, you should really strive to sense your body while being aware of reading it, making sure that it falls in the proper form and sequence. People walk outside, they see rain, and they go, oh, I can't believe it's rained on me. And, you know, internal considering and all of that. They're not looking at the raindrops, they're not looking at the sky, they are not perceiving them uh, in first position, the proper receiving of those impressions. Instead, that perception is pulling something else up inside them. And that what they're seeing, hearing, whatever, falls into third position. In other words, it doesn't crystallize in the proper form and sequence. So this becomes 
this is sort of all preliminary uh, in terms of understanding the nature of impressions, understanding what it means, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate for me in my being, receiving impressions, what we see, hear, smell, taste, coming in in the first position, and the way we make sure it comes in the first position and doesn't fall into third position is through the sensation of self, through the awareness of our body as one organic whole. And in this way, we begin to crystallize properly within us. But through the abnormal development of humanity, through the abnormal development of our being, we have distorted and um, deformed essences because the essence is really what crystallizes within us within uh, the realm of the world 24. Uh, identification is actually a world 24 phenomenon but it is a wrong deformed crystallization and identification is in part one of the misuses of c12 now i don't want to get too far ahead of myself i prefer to talk more about that in the um next meeting i'm just going to stop sharing this um at this point are there any questions uh anything that we need that you would like to further explain um ian um, in the quote from Beelzebub, under reason of understanding, he says something like the, the impressions received from without in whichever localization happens to be the center of gravity functioning serve as the whole affirming. Yeah. Does he mean, so I, I understand I, I think I'm. I think by localization he means any one of the three brains. Yeah, and you know he also means you know previously perceived impressions. Uh, you don't fully hear the. You, you're not hearing my words. That is pulling up something from inside you. Uh, if you could step back from the words and just hear the sounds and the different parts of language, but something is being pulled up from inside you. And, you know, you talk to certain elderly people and everything you say brings something up. Uh, there are people when you're talking to them, they're not listening to what you're saying. They're waiting for a gap in your speech pattern so that they can interject they, everything that you're saying is just bringing up things inside them that they want to get out. And I think he's talking about that. Um, I mean, we have to look at this within ourselves. We have to understand within ourselves how things are called up from within and if you begin and you know how to mindfully look, listen, smell, taste, if you're able to hold the awareness of your mm -hmm. physical self, your organic body in the back of your awareness, you will have an idea of the proper way that we are supposed to receive impressions and the proper way that we're supposed to grow our form, uh, the proper form and sequence that we're supposed to grow our being. The other ones, you know, someone walks out and they see rain and it's like they sucked a lemon. They're pulling up a negative feeling from their emotional center, from their emotions. Um, you walk by someone and they look just like your enemy and they're pulling up a visual impression which is linked to an emotional impression and you're not seeing that person as a unique individual they're just reminding you of what is going on. And most people live in this state where they are not really present in the moment. 
where they are not aware of what is going on around them in the moment, where they are not mindful here and now, but rather they're living in a very subjective dream-like state where Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, the difference between sleep and the waking consciousness, or what I prefer to call waking sleep, there's very little difference except one, we're walking around, and he said we become immensely more dangerous because at least when we're asleep, we're asleep and we can't harm. And through the manipulation, I mean, uh, advertising, the whole advertising industry manipulates impressions, political parties. They may not use this terminology, but they manipulate it and they use it all the time to bring up feelings, to bring up states, to bring up all sorts of things within people. And, you know, if we could learn to properly receive impressions, if we can learn to hold in the back of our awareness, that awareness of our body, and by holding our body in the background of our awareness in second position, we are preventing this abnormal growth. So, you know, the, 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 the sacred denying in that phrase is the awareness, the sensation of self. This is why it's one of the most important skills we must learn, one of the skills we have to learn at the beginning of our development, because we want to get so good that when we're aware of our body, we are less prone to having all of these other things pulled up inside of ourselves. Someone frowns at us and we get upset, or we look at our bank balance and we're horrified or we're pleased when we see these numbers on a screen. And so much of what comes up is really subjective. It's really a result of sort of abnormal crystallizations that have happened within ourselves. Um, does that clarify or that you, you, you need more clarification? Um, I'm going to have to chew on it a little bit. I'm not, yeah. I'm not entirely sure. But I mean, this, this is an immense topic. Uh, understanding this, we begin to understand a lot of what Mr. Gurdjieff was trying to do. Um, to receive, to properly, clearly receive impressions. Um, he talks about four states of consciousness. Sleep, uh, the waking state or waking sleep. Personal consciousness, which I use the word self-reflectivity or self-consciousness. And then objective consciousness. The first three involve a degree of subjective consciousness. The third one personal consciousness, we're beginning to develop an awareness of objective consciousness. But objective consciousness is to see things as they really are. We don't realize how much we project onto our world. We look around, we see a house, we see a person, we see a hat, we see a dog. Those are projections. Um, I used to call it the tulip test. Uh, my daughter used to have a rabbit called tulip. And if Tulip sees it and I see it, there's a certain level of objective reality to it. Tulip wouldn't see a chair. She wouldn't see a table. She wouldn't see a mug. She wouldn't see all of these things that we automatically see. And what we're seeing is a projection onto our environment. And if we allow the projection to be in first position, the identification, we identify that as a chair, a mug, or whatever. We are creating these abnormal growths within ourselves that is inhibiting our ability to awaken and to grow our being. So we, in order to understand uh, the misuse of C12, it also really helps to understand how we are supposed to be receiving things from an objective and impartial perspective. Um, any other questions in the last couple of minutes? Um, I know we disappeared from Facebook and came back to Facebook and uh, um, perhaps we've disappeared from it. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, I 
it's hard to say. If I move my hand, it's about 10 seconds later. Um, I think I see my hand move. I'm not sure. I'm just watching it right now. Um, okay, it seems to be longer than 10 seconds. And maybe there's a bit of a delay. I'm not sure. Uh, I was hoping to get it so that people could ask questions from Facebook, but uh, um, maybe that's too much to hope for. Um, so, okay, let's, let's again finish becoming aware of our body, aware of our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, aware of our body from side to side, from front to back, back to front, from inside out and outside in. Try in a single moment to be aware of your whole body, to develop the sensation of self. Try to be aware of your body as one organic whole. And then hold this in the back of your awareness. Put this in second position so that it occupies the sacred denying. And then become aware of the light coming into your eyes, what you're seeing, what your eyes are seeing. Become aware of what your ears are hearing, the sounds coming in. And even though you cannot not hear me speak in English, try to become aware of perhaps the timbre of my voice, the tone of my voice. Perhaps become aware of the rhythm of my words. Focus on something more objective in my voice. And then try to become aware of the scents in the air, perhaps your own scent the environment around you, the odor, and then become aware of the taste in your mouth while holding on to that sensory awareness of your body. And through doing this, through this mindful receiving of visual impressions, aware of your eyes receiving these visual impressions, and this mindful receiving of auditory impressions, your ears receiving sound, this mindful awareness of your olfactory impressions, your nose receiving scent, and this mindful awareness of the taste in your mouth while holding that awareness of your body, while being in this awareness, while being aware of yourself here and now, the awareness of me here and what here means coming in through the external senses. And the me, the awareness of your body, the awareness of yourself as an embodied being. And through doing this, you are actually creating crystallizations within you that are done in the proper form and sequence. The other crystallizations, all other crystallizations, most human activity creates these abnormal crystallizations these abnormal impressions, these abnormal growths within us. It is through self-remembering, or as I've mentioned, self-remembering has a twin. Uh, I think Mr. Gurdjieff used the word active being mentation in that it's the last paragraph of the chapter of form and sequence. He describes it. And there we're using the thoughts and images in our mind while having that reality of our body and the reality of our feelings uh, to work through that. And, but the best way, the easiest way is to, as often as you can, to remember yourself, to remember yourself in the proper form and sequence. And if you are new to this work, to just work on sensing yourself, to sense yourself walking down the road, sitting down on the bus, reaching out for that mug of coffee, just to begin with the sensation of yourself and try to become aware of your whole self, your whole body. And when you sufficiently crystallized this dimension of yourself, the ability to sense your body as one organic whole, also to begin working on crystallizing visual, auditory, olfactory, and gustatory impressions within you. And this is like the positive and negative end of a battery, and between this a substance grows, 
and the substance is the crystallization within ourself that ultimately becomes our Kesjian body. And, uh, you know, people call it the astral body or the emotional body, but they don't realize that we have to grow it. And we grow it through the proper form and sequence. So next meeting, I will get on to the actual misuse of C12 and look at the different ways we misuse it through identification, negative emotions, daydreaming, lying, the formatory thinking, and um, various other ways that we leak energy so that when we understand how we leak energy, we can begin to try to fix those leaks. Um, at any rate, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, being here today. And Laura, can you hear me? Okay, I can't hear you. I want you to stay on because you somehow figured out how to get into this meeting. And uh, for all the rest of you, um, you know, I'm going to, uh, uh, how do I get off Facebook? Um, I'm going to uh, leave Facebook, I hope. Um, uh, stop streaming. Um, uh, hopefully this has got me off Facebook. Laura, uh, I mean, for the rest of you, uh, I haven't talked to you, Laura. Um, can you speak? Okay, down in your screen, down on the left, there's a thing that says mute. You're not muted, but there's a triangle facing up. And if you could click on that triangle, and switch to audio settings. Somehow we're not getting you. Um, okay, I'm not. I'm still not hearing you. Um, Okay, um, do you want to send me a message through Facebook, Laura? Are you on Facebook? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, can you send me a message through Facebook? Okay, and we'll connect through Facebook. Um, um, thank you, the rest of you. Um, I think we're gone. Um, so send me a message through Facebook, okay. And